Somebody pointed out that in New York Laundry, you could describe it as a poor slacking. Uh, it's a farmer for a supply, thank you. So I'm, I'm lucky to have enough thank yous to be able to even get it out of my mouth to write my own thank yous. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, I think it's wonderful that you're all here because I think of my whole career very much as a joint enterprise. It's not that I do stuff. It's just that I did stuff, it would be useless. The only thing that makes anything that I'm worth doing, that I'm doing, worth doing, is the people in this room. It's not communicating with people, it's not coming up with ideas that other people pick up, and of course it's not something that starts with me as a chain. There were many people that came before me that I learned from, and then I do some stuff, some stuff, and so on. I'm very glad to see that there's been a couple of babies around the place, so there's a lot of supply for the future. So, um, I think you should all give yourselves a round of applause. This is really very much a joint uh, enterprise. So, uh, and I, I an audience, what can I say? Um, Sam, I think it's very hard to convince me to say nothing. Um, I'm going to play the wrong old man and say, well, I'm not just going to ask if you can, so why are you here? So I want to talk about some of those. And the reason I like to do this is I am kind of affectionate for these ideas. And people have picked up on them the way they've done with the other ideas. And so I love the general audience to say, I think this stuff is sort of neat. Maybe you can pick it up and do something. I'm going to talk about three things, two papers that I've written. One is called the Journal of Random Isomorphism. And it was based on observing something that many of you have observed in the paper, well, most of you observed just a tutorial or a gloss on what Reynolds and Gerard did, um, but also about integrating the things that you helps you to see things in a new light. So it's why I came up with the representation theorem, which says that every function that can be proved total Second order piano arithmetic can be represented in second order Latin calculus. And if you look at the proof, what that really involves is you take a proof that something is total in um, second order piano arithmetic and you turn it into a term of second order Latin calculus that computes that thing. So it's a projection function that puts proofs into terms. And if you look at Reynolds abstraction theorem, it takes, um, it says that terms in second order Latin calculus take related arguments to related results um, for some suitable version of one relation. And you can view that as a new bag that takes a term in second order of um, in second order Latin calculus into a proof in uh, kind of logic. So you can almost view these as inverse values and you can even paper chips if they form an embedding projection there. And then in this, uh, for a certain part of the range, they're actually an isomorphism. And the interesting thing is Rutherford is a very powerful but he's got this precise correspondence between the things in the logic and the things in the computational language. What happens is that when you are that Rutherford Bits of the logic can erase if you believe what the passes with the second order of Latin calculus that's a small error of the connection. There's a good line that I'm talking about. We have to all over types, but all over propositions. Every proposition, uh, all 
all of the ties, all of the individuals, and the potential. And now the law of the process is a strata that originally passes to the master water, to the tallest water, to match the time structure. And the thing I like about this is the definitions of water populations are actually fairly complicated. And especially if you look at St. Derek Ryers, where he does some amazing stuff, but then also, uh, you get, uh, pretty large populations, they get amazingly complicated. But the problem with Derek Ryers is he's way too smart. And I will return to that problem later. Uh, but, yeah, you know, we can define everything fairly simply, so it's a bracket of mapping of groups. In terms, and so on the left here, I have the group system, and on the right, I have uh, again a system to individuals, but the individual stuff that is terms of all time. And it takes a group of certain properties into a well typing term. And this corresponds exactly to what Turbot did in his work. And then going the other way, you're taking uh, a derivation term of the term is well time, and you turn it into a group so that it satisfies a certain property. So this is sort of the essence of block population, and it's a sort of something of a function type that they can be. What does that whole part of property? Does that whole part of it? What does the overall mass of my bank? If X satisfies the property corresponding to A, then that function of my bank satisfies the function. And I'm going to let people know about logical relations. Like, wait, logical relations are about two things. And this is just about one thing. So, this is a unary logical relation. And we're just a binary logical relation. And the paper actually contains another algorithm called doubling, which is just like any drop. And seeing everything twice is that you only see certain things twice. So that gives us the actual law of population boundaries. It's a composition. It's a fairly straightforward way of explaining what's going on in terms of law of population. That's all I want to say about that. Yeah, that's all I want to say. So, John Reynolds is brilliant. Derek Dreyer is brilliant. Logical relations are great. This is a different way to be able to justify the group transformations that I think they have some value. That journey of the group that we do is not the group that Derek is seeking to do. So Derek and his collaborators on races and groups is one of them. And your link is one of the other things. And see if it's making it a little bit simpler. Anyhow, I like it. I encourage you to go off to read the paper and see if you like it too. So the design is a group called All I Value is Dual, called by name. It produces the dual calculus, which um, has not been mentioned once or twice today. Uh, so the origin of this, right, one of the things I love about this field, right, is we can be like in the Twitter view of the SAI machine. Right, so here we have this summer notebook. Here we have a machine for calculating things with functional programs. Those op codes were designed in the 1930s. That, that was just so fantastic. So the fact that we can go back in history and appreciate history and that can give us a guide for where to go, I find amazing. Um, so here's an example from Gary Jensen on the secret calculus. So this is his actual rewriting of the incumbent. Rewriting down exactly the same way today, on just the same thing, except the letters A and B will not be in German. Um, so, use exactly this form. Uh, so, here's the sequence calculus for conjunction and disjunction and your quantifiers. I'm just going to focus on the conjunction and disjunction. And so, the other propositions as types, also called Curry Howard, also called Vermont uh, Hyphen or Gara, whatever you like. Uh, the things in the room here correspond exactly the sequence that you would find in Hensley's work. 
and then we use the designs of the terms, the terms that we're going to label things. So the terms have to be put on the file you have uh, an encoding of the whole first tree as part of your sequence. That's your long term memory documents are are encodings of a, a logical first tree. And so if you I presume you memorized that the rules from here. Just memorize the and rules and the or rules, which is easy, right? Because they're dual, so you just need to memorize one set of rules. And there are the and rules, and there are the or rules. I did you get some examples of the terminology. Now, yes, and sequence just meant two sides. But to make this work, it turns out you need to break the sequence into three different parts. And uh, I would rather represent this in line 16 and uh, no longer in the value of the right? So I'm just going to have to understand that I'm going to make what is that mean? I'm going to make it very hard for you to play on my courses and I'm going to get into the law because I'm not explaining clearly enough. And I think I can appear in the dark place with politics and communication is very complicated. So I mean, the simple time that I thought very hard about what to do with. I saw
we just when you write down programs. The latter one from Buckeaster is great. And the same is true for reductions. I think the same is actually true for the timing rules as well. The latter stuff is just a lot easier to read, and that's why people often do it. Nonetheless, I think there's an advantage in looking at things both with an or not. In the original paper, um, and yet I made an analogy to uh, the Pompey Day Center, which looks kind of ugly because all the structures on the outside, but it also has a kind of beauty to that. So yes, it does get more complicated and reduction. Everything is more complicated than taking reductions. I would agree with that. Well, okay, so that's all I want to say about that. Uh, and the third is paper called Well, High Programs Can't Be Played. When we offer a body that we're at it. So this is about writing and typing. And a lot of work sits with Carl Mott and Tima, among others. Continuing this grand report. And uh, I thought, you know, nobody's really paid proper attention to it. It actually has a fair number of citations, which of course I should be pleased with. Um, but, and they should be, but basically, people read it and sign it and ignore it. Uh, and what they're ignoring is the idea of the playing fair in itself. And I think the reason they, they have a very good reason for doing the right well, I'll put it possibly to that thing. With this calculus, where you get now, 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 three, now, 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 now,
may not understood the importance of play, and I didn't turn back much to play that game when you play. So the game can also get upset about people ignoring play, except it's mainly the kids in his own team. Turns out the kids and students don't often go to the kids. It's kind of fun. Um, uh, so the game can never resolve that uh, why people in the black room can play the very hard work they had to play.
go on my whole dynamic range. And if you look at the rules, of your small game, um, you go to rules to see carriers have to play in these small game games. So, it is the least precise time. It was the most powerful, the greatest game decision. Um, and so this tells you is, if you have um, a more precise time to a less precise time, you will never get a positive play. You might get a negative play, but you will never get a positive play. And if you go the other way, you put a dynamic in the context, you can stand it up. You can not get negative play, play in the context, but you will never play the static in the context. So these say going from S to a static in the context is very key to the dynamic in the context. You will always end up playing the dynamic in the context. Yes, well, even in the graphically timed programs, all the errors end up in the dynamically timed context, not the statically timed context. But that's, of course, what you would expect. But this is a nice way of formulating and proving that, and that's why the play is important. Because it lets us prove, say, and prove this obvious property that you lack a gradually timed language to satisfy. And as far as I know, only the thesis group and the work that I've done uh, with Jeremy and other colleagues. Uh, deals with playing and everybody else still ignores it. I think it's actually worth paying attention to. So anyhow, this is why you got these four things, which is really easy to about. Two well-known ones, or very sub-typing, and I use sub-typing and it turns out they can play to the two things you need, which are positive and negative sometimes. So there's a really good reason for having four of these things. But I think basically my advice to you is any paper in which you have four subtyping relations, that is three too many. Oh, cold tanner, you have your regular tanner, you got these pieces and things that want to be reassembled, but it is something else familiar. And that is that turns out our two pieces, positive and negative subtyping. So we reassemble them into the square of ordinary subtyping and then half subtyping subtyping. Yes? It's interesting because it's the obvious thing to do. Of course, it ought to be covariant. Oh, well, that, that doesn't work, but here it does. Uh, just these two, yes. But. Remember what I said about the important thing is that people pick up on your work and do something interesting with it. The gradual guarantee that Jeremy is talking about is a brilliant example of that. It's amazing that they pick up on that. So, to conclude, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of being stupid. So, first off, the slide about the There. Um, the first off, and these are the three papers, and we're going to play one out of this uh, quite more recent paper, because it's actually a German and we've written about this uh, slice to the other related work. So I'll put this up on the web, and it's, I think, piqued the interest of any of you who actually want to go off and read any of these papers. Uh, the further citation is in the East of Hodges. So, take that away. Our talk about people who are too smart. This is basically everybody in this room. You are all incredibly clever. And there's a real risk in being incredibly clever, which is you can understand really complicated stuff. But this is me trying to read one of your papers. I'm not as clever as you. I can't understand that complicated stuff. And this is actually me reading my own papers. When I wrote the paper, I was sort of like this, and then later I go back three years later and read the paper, and I'm like, whoop, whoop, I'm like that. 
Uh, um, so all of us are too clever. And all of us are too stupid. We're all too clever when we write our papers. And we're all too stupid when we read them. But the solution to that is, write your paper for the stupid person that's going to read it, which is me. Not for the clever person who's writing it, which is you.